infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, Bartonella are globally distributed bacteria that can cause disease in both humans and domestic animals. Now, bats have been implicated as a likely reservoir host for these bacteria. However, little is known about how prevalence varies over time, routes of transmission, and the genetic diversity of Bartonella in bats. Now, my guest today shed some new light on this topic in a study published in the journal PLOS, Neglected Tropical Diseases. Joining me now is postdoctoral researcher with the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the Montana State University in Bozeman and the lead author of the study, Daniel Becker, Ph.D. Dr. Becker, welcome to the show, sir. Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. You bet. Well, let's start out by giving the audience a uh, primer on the bacterium Bartonella. Um, Dr. Becker, how is this organism important concerning pathology in humans? Sure. Well, um, I think some readers might be familiar with Bartonella through um, sort of thinking and, and hearing about cat scratch fever uh, in, in people. Um, this is caused by uh, one particular species of Bartonella. Um, and there's a couple others. Uh, one species of Bartonella that's kind of widespread in um, Andes in Peru that also causes a disease called um, Carrion's disease. Uh, so this can range, um, kind of a range of, of pathologies, but uh, sort of some some symptoms can include sort of heart disease, and so it's sort of one of these these pathogens that you know, can have zoonotic relevance for people, um, you know, and, and can range from acute to sort of more severe uh, symptoms and disease. Now, does this bacterium cause infection in the bat itself, or is the bat merely a carrier? Well, that's, that's a really good question, um, and sort of part of why we went out to, to sort of write up this paper and, and do this extra analysis. Um, so there's been a lot of work on, on Bartonella in bats. Um, it seems to be kind of incredibly common, um, and prevalence is often very high in the bat populations that are sampled. Um, I don't think we're we're yet incredibly clear on whether there's sort of any consequences um, for the bat itself. Uh, for now, it seems like it's potentially a carrier, um, but there's kind of a, a good deal of some follow-up work that, that we could do to help answer whether, whether you know, this, this bacterium actually causes disease and has consequences for survival in, in the bat itself. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and jump into the study, and I guess my first basic question is, you know, why study Bartonella in vampire bats in Latin America? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, like I mentioned, a lot of bats have been have been studied for Bartonella uh, globally, um, including vampire bats in the past. Um, and when we think about Bartonella, we we tend to think about this being transmitted by by arthropod vectors, um, fleas, sand flies, in the case of Carrion's disease. Um, but if you look at you know, some some systems like cat scratch fever, for example, that's that's a case where you have a host directly scratching a person, and that that causes the infection. Um, there's been some evidence in in cats and, and dogs, for example, where people have found Bartonella in uh, the saliva of those animals. So so vampire bats are really unique uh, in that they're feeding entirely on on blood, um, mostly mammal blood. But sometimes they'll feed on on chickens and other sort of domestic birds. Uh, so, you know, you have this this animal that every night is going out and it's feeding on animals ranging from uh, kind of domestic animals near household to livestock, um, large wild mammals, and in a lot of cases in Latin America, uh, they're also feeding on on people, uh, often in kind of more remote um, human communities. Uh, and so because I guess another aspect to add about, about vampire bat ecology is that 
you know, they have a very kind of high risk of starvation. Um, so they'll die within about 72 hours of not feeding. So every night there's this really big pressure to go out and basically find a source of blood. Uh, and then every single feeding attempt is really a, a possible transmission event um, if they can be spreading something through their saliva. And so rabies is kind of the the main pathogen that's really studied in vampire bats for this reason. Um, so we're partially just interested in you know whether or not uh, Bartonella could possibly be spread uh, through vampire bat saliva and what risks that might pose to prey, be it livestock or, or people themselves. Now, I, I read through the, the study itself on PLUS, neglected tropical diseases, and it, it looks quite complex. Um, Dr. Becker, can you talk about the methods you use uh, regarding the sampling, regarding uh, the, the molecular analysis, et cetera? Sure. Yeah, well, you're, you're definitely right. There's um, kind of a lot in this paper. Uh, so we had actually published a kind of an earlier manuscript looking at how the, the prevalence of a few different infections, including Bartonella, um, correlated with the, the local density of, of livestock prey for vampire bats. Um, and as a part of in this study, we wanted to, to really hone in and focus on what's going on with Bartonella in particular. Um, we had kind of a very, like a, a pretty decent data set to do this. So we went out into the field um, and sampled vampire bats from about 10 different colonies over a two-year period. So if you're going out uh, in the field, you're catching bats with uh, mist nets, kind of either as they're leaving their, their roost in a cave or as they're kind of foraging, um, take a small blood sample. Uh, and then bring that blood sample back um, to the lab, in this case at the, the University of Georgia, where um, Brad was a PhD student and did the bulk of this work. Um, and then we basically analyzed those blood samples, extracted DNA, did PCR, um, just to establish whether these bats were infected or not. Uh, and then we, we sequenced a, a small set of those samples to do the, some phylogenetic analyses, so trying to see just first off, you know, what we're picking up in the vampire bats, what's that related to? Um, is that related to any Bartonella that's been derived from you know, livestock, from other bats, from bat ectoparasites and whatnot? Uh, we did some basic kind of statistical analyses to see, you know, does uh, infection prevalence, does it vary over time? You know, we did a two-year study, so within each of those different populations of bats, is prevalence more or less the same, uh, or is it fluctuating? And then the work that I think is, is really cool, a lot of this was done um, by Laura Bergner, uh, who's now a postdoc at um, University of Glasgow. Um, so she had collected, uh, and her colleagues from the same sites, uh, basically saliva swabs um, and fecal swabs from vampire bats, and they did a separate uh, metagenomic study, you know, so basically trying to look for what's the general community of, of viruses and, and bacteria in those samples. And so they were able to pull out um, Bartonella DNA from those samples, and then we basically reanalyzed saliva and feces with the same PCR method. Uh, so what we were trying to get in that last analysis, you know, was really if you look at these bats, what you're picking up in the blood, what you're picking up in the saliva and feces, are those more or less the same thing? Um, so I, I just sort of threw a lot at you. But I think that's, that's kind of in a nutshell, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the separate analyses that we did. So looking at what Bartonella is related to, um, you know, does it sort of vary over time? What are the individual risk factors for infection? And then trying to piece together is there evidence of Bartonella in saliva which could support, you know, transmission through through biting. Um, and is there Bartonella in the bat that feces, which could be just another way that bats or, or other animals are are exposed. Now was this sampling done from one or, or more more countries? So this was done uh, that's, a, that's a good question. This was done in um, two geographically pretty different regions of Peru. Um, so the, the sort of northwest 
Peruvian Amazon, the Department of Amazonas, um, and the nearby Department of Cajamarca. Um, Amazonas is a, a really interesting area to be working in because that's where there's been a, a series um, in the past five, ten years uh, of vampire bat rabies outbreaks in, right. in people. Um, so often in, in these really rural communities, uh, it's you know, kind of horrible. Um, but there's a lot of vampire bat human contact as well as vampire bat contact with livestock. Um, we also work in the, the eastern Amazon in Peru uh, in the Department of Loreto. Um, this is where the city of Iquitos is. Uh, so again, sort of a lot of sort of communities of people living along parts of the river um, where you know, kind of livestock ownership is variable, and so there's also a lot of sort of vampire bat problems going on there, with feeding on people's livestock or chickens and whatnot. Um, and then we also did this work uh, up in Belize, um, where I've been continuing to study um, vampire bats and, and their pathogens. Uh, so geographically pretty widespread, mm -hmm. um, which let us you know, sort of capitalize on that geographic distribution um, for some of the phylogenetic analyses. Okay, so after all this work, all this time, uh, what did you guys learn? Um, what were your findings? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the, the main things that we found was uh, just that Bartonella is incredibly common. Um, so in these 10 different vampire bat populations, uh, like you mentioned, across two different countries, um, over this two-year period, and sometimes this was sampling twice per year, uh, we never, you know, had a sampling event where we didn't find Bartonella um, in any of those populations. So it was kind of very widespread. Uh, as a whole, prevalence was about I think 67 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had colonies and we had kind of sampling years where prevalence was you know, 100 percent in multiple locations. Um, so although we're still not entirely sure about the underlying transmission process for this bacterium, um, we feel somewhat confident that it's sort of one of these endemic infections, right? So it's not necessarily having these really big spikes and then big lows in prevalence, but it could just be that the infection is kind of always present um, and at an overall pretty high prevalence. So I think that was one of the, the main takeaways. Um, Another another neat result that we found was just trying to piece together how Bartonella is transmitted within the bats. Um, so these the isolates, the, the sequences we got from the blood, um, some of them were very closely related to um, Bartonella that's been extracted from bat flies. Uh, so these are one of the many ectoparasites that, that bats can carry. Um, so in some sense that supports and could support this transmission through arthropod vectors. Mm -hmm. But we also found, uh, this is sort of in contrast to some earlier work, um, we did pick up Bartonella in the saliva uh, of vampire bats, um, as well as in some of the fecal samples. Um, and these were either genetically identical or very, very closely related, about you know, 95, 97% related. Um, to the sequences that we found in the blood samples. Um, so it kind of supports that you know, the Bartonella we're seeing in, in saliva or feces isn't just you know, sort of a, a transient, something maybe they're grabbing from their prey. Um, that's sort of indicative of potential systematic infection. Um, so I think this, this result really kind of highlights that there is this, this possibility at least for um, direct transmission through biting or through sort of fecal you know, exposure to bat feces, um, which is definitely something that may be nice to follow up in uh, in future work. Um, but was, I think, pretty exciting for us because mm -hmm. until now, I don't think anyone's found um, Bartonella in bat saliva. Uh, and given sort of the high rates of, of contact that vampire bats have with other species through biting, uh, it's sort of a an important suggested result for for future studies. And that really uh, leads me into my final question. Um, 
Do you personally have any follow-up research planned uh, on this topic? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we do a, a little bit. So uh, been working on sort of the colonies that we sampled in Belize. Um, continued to to monitor those vampire bat populations every year. Um, so I think at this point we're up to I think four years uh, of data now on sort of Bartonella infection prevalence. Um, so one thing we're trying to do is build up a, a kind of long-term time series of this infection. Uh, so in this paper we're talking about here, we're only able to compare prevalence over two years. Um, so we're hoping to keep to really keep that longitudinal study in place uh, so that we can get at, you know, is this infection really kind of endemic but highly prevalent over time, or do we start to see some kind of uh, temporal patterns or big pulses? Um, and, and part of the cool part of that work will be taking mathematical models of transmission of Bartonella in vampire bats uh, and seeing which of them can can sort of best match up with the data that we see. Um, and then the point of that analysis is just to try and figure out, you know, what's the relative contribution of arthropod vectors to transmission versus direct contact through biting um, or through this kind of potential environmental exposure route. It's really trying to capitalize on a, a long-term study uh, to understand, you know, how this infection persists in the vampire bat populations, how it's spread, uh, and how it potentially could spread to, to other species. Well, it's definitely a very fascinating topic, and I'll put a link to the study um, on the podcast page when that gets published. And I want to thank you, Dr. Daniel Becker, for your time and your expertise, sir. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much for talking today. You bet.